So in the first segment of this hand-build demo, I'm going to show two ways of making slabs that you can do at home. Uh, what's new is I'm going to be issuing uh, equipment when you come to your lab portion of the class, things like these boards and some slump molds that'll make your project um, much more straightforward. I'll start with the way of using uh, wire and these guide boards to make, to regulate the thickness of a slab. Just by doing this, this re resembles a cheese cutter. So now I've already got a slab, a thickness that I like. If I want this to be more of a square, I can throw it out like this, or I can just uh, use a template to um, cut out a shape. I think I'm going to try that first. Okay, this is not quite big enough, so I'm going to spread it out just a little bit more. There we go. So when I say the template, another word for that is a pattern. Um, this particular pattern is four-sided, but I want you to notice that it's not straight-sided. Each side is curved. Uh, some people see me do this, and then they make a straight-sided pattern, and just take my word for it, you're not going to like it. <laughs> so. The next step is to trace with the needle tool the outer edge of the pattern and then remove the excess. Now, the next thing would be to lay this over a slump mold. This is made of plaster. The magic of plaster is that it sucks the moisture out of the clay, and so there's no need for any kind of release agent like talc or um, cornstarch or anything like that. The plaster will suck the moisture out of the clay and it will release. So I could just go to the next step, which would be to uh, press this down over the slump mold. But I would also like to introduce, before I do that, I'd like to introduce some uh, ways of making textures and designs using different um, materials that we have already have here at school. I can loan you some of these materials too. So for instance, this, this mesh, uh, I'm, I'm going to start by using this mesh. Um, on, on one portion of the slab that I just rolled out. So I want to do this before, if I'm going to put a decoration on the inside of the bowl, I'm going to want to do it before I lay it on the form. So here what I'm doing is smashing the pattern down using a rolling pin. Um, you can actually do some composing um, with, by using various uh, stamps. Here, this one's a, this is a wooden stamp. I can do something like that. And this is this is where it's so quick and easy to do this. Um, you you'll want to experiment with a variety of ways to create texture. But this gives you a good idea of how straightforward that process really is. Okay, now that I've put a texture on it, I'm going to put it over my slump mold. And you just want to make sure that it conforms to the shape of the plaster mold. And now there's the matter of applying a foot. So. 
a lot of times people get really frustrated with this step. So I'm going to show some very direct ways of creating a foot. Let's start by making another slab. Okay, so here at school, we have these cookie cutters that could be used to start making a foot. And basically, it's just a very uniform circle that you can use to cut away a segment of the, your slab. And now you've got a very uh, concise and uh, symmetrical circle. And I'm going to take a smaller one and create an insert. And this is the one. This is the part I'm wanting to save because it's the one that resembles a foot. Now. The next thing I want to introduce is the technique of scoring. I'm going to use the same tool to scope out or center um, a sort of diagram of where I want the foot to be. And what I want, what I'm looking for is um, the center, and the way I do that is I look, I have my head right over the top of the project, and I'm looking to see if the ring here is at equal distance from all of the sides before I make a mark. So now I've marked it. I'm going to take a scoring tool. and score where I'm going to uh, attach the foot. You could use a needle tool to score, but it's not a very efficient tool. So we have these scoring tools that work a lot better. And basically, you're just making a kind of trough. You really want to make an quite an impression, because you're making a trough to, you could either add water, slip, or this, what we call magic handle slip. This is a new innovation. Um, we didn't have this sort of thing when I was in college. So this is, a, this is a new addition to the ways of getting clay to attach really well. So I'm just going to apply some of this magic slip, magic handle what are we calling it? Magic water for handle attachments, handle and foot. So I'm using this instead of water. I think it has what's called a, a palmer medium in it, a lot like um, an acrylic palmer. Now I'll also want to score the foot that I'm going to attach. So I'm going to do that too. Add a little bit of magic water. Now, the trick to making this look professional is by not handling the foot any more than you absolutely have to. So I've got it the right size and shape. I've got it in the center. I've scored it. Here's the part where, if I was watching you do it, you would try to clean it up. Oh, Mr. Field, I want to fix this little thing that's not any. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to just leave it alone. <laughs> okay? Uh, that, that's the trick to making a foot look professional, is that once you've done it, you leave it alone. 
put it aside, do another project. So I'm going to, oh, and you'll want to sign it, of course. So I'm going to practice what I preach. I'm going to leave this alone, put that aside, and show another way of making a clay slab. So this next way I call the pizza man way of making a slab. I'm, take, I'm going to wedge up a ball of clay about two pounds. Oh, I better put the lid on this. I actually don't need quite that much. This is a good size. I'm going to use another way of saying that you, this is about two pounds. Another way of knowing that is the size of two fists is, is, is a good measure for the size of the slab I'm going to make. OK, so I'm going to start by smashing it down on both sides. Notice that I keep rotating it so that I'm getting the, the trick is to do the same thing over and over again in a uniform way. Now, once I get it about an inch thick, it's time to do the next technique, which is what, where it gets its name, the pizza man. You're going to be throwing this around like you would if you were making pizza dough. Now, if I was going to show this in slow motion, you would see that the way I'm tossing it down is at a diagonal or an angle. And so it strikes at one end and stretches out at the other like that. So people see me do this, and what they do is just I go straight down. That doesn't really do anything. So that's a waste of energy. And sometimes it might even stick to the surface. Oh, it's important to note that I'm using a very porous surface. This is a table that's been stretched with canvas. Um, so you'll want to be sure that you're not working on a non-porous surface like a, a masonite countertop or something like that, because the clay will just stick to it. Always use a porous surface. OK, so the next part of this is, as you throw it out, it's going to look oval-shaped. So you want to grab it and throw it out in the other direction. So the oval becomes round again. And so this takes practice. But with practice, you can get this a very uniform thickness. Now, if you're in your first attempts, you're not satisfied that it's a uniform thickness, you can always come back and uh, roll, use the roller to sort of unify it or where, wherever it might be um, different. OK. So um, another slump mold style is what I call the sock. So what I've done is it is what it sounds like. I've taken some vermiculite which is a soil aggregate that you can get at a hardware store. Uh, and I've put it inside a, um, a leotard a toe and, it, and tied it off. So now I have this soft, round shape. I'm going to put it on a board here in the center of the board. And then I'm going to put my slab on that. Now this time, I'm going to use momentum to uh, get the clay to conform to the slump mold. Now if you're doing this in the classroom, or if you're doing this at home with people around you, you're going to want to notify them before you slam this down on the table, because it makes a loud and alarming sound. So I'm going to make a loud noise now. 
Um, I also noticed that I did it on a dusty table. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it actually works if I drop it on the floor. I'm going to do that one more time. OK, so now, using momentum, I've got the clay to stretch and conform uniformly all the way around. Um, and what this, this way features a, uh, a kind of extra rim around the outside of the form. So what I'm going to do next is put it on a banding wheel. Banding wheels are typically very heavy for a reason. The purpose of a heavy banding wheel is so that you can turn it. You want to get it centered like you would if you were trimming a bowl on the pottery wheel. There we go. Now, the reason why I want to use a banding wheel to do this step is so that the tool that I'm using to cut the outer rim, I, I want to be able to hold that tool still while the piece is turning. So can you see how important the banding wheel is to getting a uniform uh, round cut? Ta-da, like that. All right. So I still need to have a foot on this. I'm going to show another way to create a foot using coils. When I make a coil, I start out with a kind of cigar shape like that. And then I'm going to roll it on the table. And beginners, when they first see me do this, they don't, they, when they try to do it, the coil ends up flat. And there's a couple of basic mistakes people make that causes the coil to be flat uh, on one side. So the first mistake is holding your fingers parallel like this and using a really short stroke like this. If you don't give the clay a chance to rotate a couple of times, that's going to cause the, um, the coil to go flat. See how flat that is? Um, so to rectify that, I'm going to spread my fingertips out. And instead of going on a very uniform parallel sort of stroke, I'm going to change the angles of my fingers as I do it, as I'm uh, rolling it. And notice I'm rolling it, there's a, at least about a foot. Uh, the, the track I'm using is about a foot long. That way I get a nice uniform round coil. Now, the next mistake that beginners make is they try to attach the coil without, well, a round shape doesn't have a lot of surface area for contact. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to shape the coil the way I want it on the piece. Let me get this uniform. I'm going to shape the coil the way I want it first. But before I attach it to my artwork, I'm going to take the coil. I'm going to slam it. I'm going to use momentum again to cause the surface area to be, uh, to add more surface area to the ring, like that. It's real simple. Bam, like that. Now, I'm going to use the ring as a template. I'm 
to mark, gently mark, the diagram for where I'm going to score. I'll use the scoring tool. Look how I'm using the, the uh, turntable in my favor. It just makes it more efficient. I'm also going to score the flat side of the coil that I made. And then once again, instead of using water or slip, we're going to use the newfangled magic water in the scored areas. And then once again, the trick to making this look professional is once you've, put, once you've placed it and pushed it down gently, you're going to leave it alone. You're not going to try to clean it up or anything like that. Oh, well, you'll want to sign it. But then this could go into the damp room. Actually, with this vermiculite sock under here, you could just put it over in the green area, and it's ready, it's ready for the next step. Um, Later, when it's bone dry, you'll want to get a wet sponge and erode the edges here so that they look, that they're not chippy. Uh, a really sharp edge on a bowl is going to be chippy when you're trying to use it. In this segment, I'm going to show two ways.